Greg, come on up here, man. We are excited to hear from our, our friend, Greg Healy, what the Lord has given to him to share with us today. Um, I want to pray for you, Greg. You want to grab Belisa's microphone? You can yell, too. I'm fine with that. <laughs> All right. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for this brother here, Lord, and we pray that the words that you give to him, Lord, would be straight from you, and that our ears would be attentive, God, hungry for the word of God and everything that you're saying to us in these days. We love you. We bless you. Ask for your spirit's presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Yesterday we did with our family. Um, I pray that you did too. Here we go. <laughs> so welcome to everybody online as well. And I just want to say a quick hi to Pastor Brad. Brad, I'm sorry you didn't get to see your mom. And I pray you get to see her soon. And I thank God for the good report. You guys are well from Tyler. And we'll look forward to seeing you soon. But uh, today, even though... Um, it's the day after Christmas, and originally when I was asked to preach, I was thinking of a nice, light Christmas, post-Christmas message. We quickly leave, we quickly come. But the Lord really weighed upon my heart to preach the message he's given me for this year, as well as really a life message for this journey that I've been on. And what I call that message, or what God calls that message, is coming out of Babylon. You might ask, well, what, what do you mean? You're coming out of ancient Iraq? I thought we left that war already. And no, I don't mean that. But biblically, we can understand what Babylon means. And if you want to make it very simple, there are two kingdoms that matter biblically, historically, for the history of the world. The kingdom of God, which is also the kingdom of heaven, and the kingdom of Babylon, which is the kingdom that Satan controls and in fact, when he tempted Jesus in the desert, you may remember this from Matthew 4, he specifically said in the third temptation, he took him up to a high mountain. He said, look at all of the world before you, all the kingdoms of this world. Those kingdoms are mine, said Satan. That's Babylon. And if you just bow down and worship me, I'll give them to you. But that's not the biblical narrative of how it goes. And of course, as believers, we know that, right? We know instead that Jesus came to this earth in humility and gave his life sacrificially as God becoming man, amazingly, mysteriously, as a prohibition for our sin. Such that he, instead of worshiping Satan to get the kingdoms of this world, can provide a free will opportunity for us, the people of God, to become and enter into the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God instead. And so we read about that in Revelation, for example, where it says the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God. It's Revelation 11. And that is the right way, not the backdoor, trapdoor, sinful way of achieving uh, ruling and reigning in the kingdoms of this earth. And so today, the message which is really a message for this coming year. So I'm actually glad this is after Christmas and now we're entering into the next year. The next thing we're going to celebrate is New Year's, right? So as we look forward into the new year, we have to ask ourselves, let this question ponder what is Babylon and what is God saying about it? In fact, there are three questions that I will leave with you. And I'm going to start off today's discussion with it. Number one, why are we commanded to come out of Babylon according to Revelation 18.4? Wait a minute, we're believers, we're Christians. I thought we weren't in Babylon. I thought we were of God's kingdom. And that lies this hidden question, which is, are we fully out of Babylon? Are we or are we not? If not, why not? Question number two. Therefore, how are we, God's people, held captive in Babylon today? 
Well, if we're not fully out and we're still held captive to some extent in some way or fashion, what might it be and how do we come out of it? And the third question I put to you is, is COVID, this uh, plague running around the earth, a Babylonian plague according to Revelation 18? And if it is, what's the implication for us, the believers of God? And I would say to you, in order for us to enter into the fullness of what God expects from us, the church, his bride, we're going to have to fully come out of Babylon to fully submit and serve ourselves to Jesus' lordship. And we're going to discover what that looks like just a little bit today in introductory form, but this is like a homework assignment. This is like, go, go and dig into this and read it for yourselves and determine what you think the answer to these questions are. Um, <clears throat> so Babylon, biblically, can be described and is described in many shapes and forms. It's also called other countries. So Babylon is likened to Egypt. Babylon is likened to Sodom. Babylon is likened to Rome and the kingdom of Herod and even the kingdom of the Pharisees. Remember when Jesus said he warned the disciples, beware of the leaven of Herod and the Pharisees. Why? Because they weren't operating in the kingdom of heaven, even though they thought they were. We just saw the beginning, at least, of the greatest story ever told. Everybody ever see that movie? 1965? Great movie. And you see Herod and the Pharisees talking about their pseudo-righteousness. Well, we, we rule the religious order around here, and we should say this or that. But they also were a part of this other kingdom. They were not Jesus' disciples. They were not God's uh, sons and daughters. Remember the Pharisees challenged Jesus when he said, you're not the sons of God, you're the sons of the devil. Why? Because they're in the kingdom of Babylon. So God's people get caught up all through the biblical narrative and biblical history in these kingdoms and they get enslaved, right? So when Israel sinned, what was God's punishment? 70 years of exile and slavery in Babylon. What was the command at the end of it? Come out of Babylon. What to do to build that second temple? Become, uh, come out of all of the sin that they were involved with while they were in captivity. Remember, Ezra told them, you must divorce your wives from Babylon. You must leave these practices of the Babylonians. They built that second temple, which was a prelude to Jesus' first coming. So I would say to you, think of this as an analogy. In these days that we're in, Jesus has already come, and we had the first Acts church. We know that was an outstanding model of the kingdom of God, right? We also know, biblically, that in preparation for Jesus' return, he will have a bride. Finish that phrase. A bride what? Without spot or wrinkle. What that means is a bride that's fully submitted to him and not remaining in partnership with the world, not remaining in partnership with the spirit of the world, to be wholly consecrated, set apart. That is what that means. So as we look forward to the Lord's return, he's calling his people out of Babylon. Now, obviously, by doing so, when you read that in Revelation 18, you have to ask yourself, well, how do we get there? And that's a longer conversation, but I'm gonna start my story a little bit with a t part of my testimony, which is about 20 years ago, I received this scripture in Isaiah 52. I was staying at the Mandarin Oriental Hotel in San Francisco. I was on a business trip. I was an investment banker working at Morgan Stanley, calling on technology firms and banks out on the West Coast. And in that time, I had this sense, because the markets were disturbed, this was after the, the tech bubble burst, I had this sense my job was at risk. And my boss who was with me was gonna have a conversation with me. And I'm praying, saying, Lord, I've never been in this position before. I've never been where my income or my career or my job was at threat. 
but now I find myself here and I'm crying out for your help. And he gave me Isaiah 52. So if we have that say, great. So this is, this is the section that, I, that was the most impactful. And so here I'm praying about what do I do with my career? I was looking at this other job at Deutsche Bank. I was still trying to uh, continue in my job at Morgan Stanley. And I get this, God saying, depart, depart, go out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her, purify yourselves who bear the vessels of the Lord. For you shall not go out in haste and you will not go out in flight. For the Lord will go before you and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. And when I read this, it brought me great comfort because I was wondering, what am I doing? What's happening to my job? Do I have a job? Do I get to get that next job? I'm worried about my income. I'm concerned about what's going to happen. How are we going to be able to pay our bills? You know, we had plenty. We, we were fine, but I still was very concerned. And God's response was, don't be concerned. I'm taking you out. I'm taking you out of this Morgan Stanley into what I thought was the next job, Deutsche Bank. But later in life, I figured out this actually was the beginning of a call where God was saying to me, You're, I'm taking you out of Babylon. And I didn't realize this scripture was related to Babylon. But this is, in fact, the call of Isaiah the prophet to God's people to come out of Babylonian captivity after 70 years of judgment of God. Come out of slavery. Come out of uh, not having the freedom to pursue God's fullness for Israel's future. So I'm pondering this, but I'm happy because I'm like, you know, God's with me. He's really given me comfort. I have peace now. And so I really was thankful for that. So um, a, sh a short month or two later, 9-11 hit. And I was on a transcontinental flight the day of 9-11. I was booked to go back to the West Coast. And same uh, boss was with me and we had our bags. We came into the city. And of course, I won't go through all of what happened in 9-11. You know what happened in 9-11, but that changed everything. That changed everything. And again, my initial reaction was, how dare those terrorists attack us? How could they do this to us? We're the United States. We're God's people. We're God's country. What did we do what, to deserve this? And my attitude, as many, maybe many of uh, American patriots' attitude was, like, how dare they? We will, how dare they? We will get them, and we will build those towers back. We'll build them bigger, better. We're America. And later in life, I discovered, and if you ever read Jonathan Kahn's book, you'll read about what that means, is that it's really a harbinger, a warning strike against our country. But for the believer, it's a warning. Don't put your trust in those things that you think are stable and strong and what makes us strong in our monetary, banking, financial market systems. Don't put your trust in that because it's fleeting. I could wipe that out in a day. And if you read Revelation 18, it really, we can turn the uh, slides. If you read Revelation 18, you can see some of the imagery of what we went through on 9-11. So part of your homework assignment is read Revelation 18, dive into it. What does it speak of? It speaks of this harlot Babylon, mystery Babylon, and all of how she relates to the commerce of the world, to the mercantilism of the world, to the financial movements and the shipping of the world, which are all now jeopardized through COVID-19, aren't they? And so what we see is that this is an economic global description of our times today. I mean, if you see it as something else, please let me know. I'd like to discuss it with you, but if you really think about it, that passage describes the global economy today. And God is saying in that passage, come out of her, my people. It's the same message Isaiah had to Israel. John the Revelator is saying, post the Lord's coming. So for the future, for now, for us, come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins and share in her plagues. So if you think about this plague and you think this is this kind of plague and you're wondering why do we have this kind of crazy 
pandemic. Some people are talking about it being an endemic now, meaning it just is going to keep circulate, circulating around the earth. How is this going on? Well, could it be that Jesus is going to do what he said he was going to do and judge the earth? He's going to judge the sin of the earth. He's going to judge the practices of Babylon. Babylon, the mystery harlot, is, has gotten all of the leaders and the merchants drunk. That's what it says. It doesn't say some of them or a few of them or like just in ancient Iraq. It says it's the whole world. This city is the whole world's leadership that's gotten drunk on her sins and her pursuit of pride and materialism and gain and self-interest and so forth. And that's the kingdom of Babylon. So when uh, I really was pressing into this 10 years later, uh, having us having gone through our own financial trial, which many of you are aware of, um, I was really pressing into the Lord, like, why did we go through this crazy trial financially and we're still, instead of you solving it with more money to fix our financial problems, you actually solved it differently. You gave us miracles, non-monetary ways of getting by, getting through, keeping our homes, being able to survive, pursuing the call of God on our lives, even though the business is in the red and the income is, is, is low or zero. How did God do that? What I now know or believe, Bridget and I both, is that he was taking us through what we must go through as a people. We cannot depend in a society that's money driven. We cannot trust in money to get by in the days ahead. We cannot trust in our own strength to get by in the days ahead. What we can make, what we can do. We're designed to work, but we're really designed to work for God and to trust in God. And whatever you do, God is not a God who helps those who help themselves. God is a God for those who serve him and help others. And when we do that and we are acting as the body of Christ, the bride, God then comes in and will help us. And truly the words of uh, Matthew 6, where Jesus, giving the Sermon on the Mount, speaks of this. And he says, seek first the kingdom of God and righteousness. Life is not all about your career, how you're going to get by, how you're going to pay for things, how you're going to get that house, how you're going to get that car. Jesus is saying for all of God's people, not just pastors, not just people who are seminarians, but for all of God's people, seek first the kingdom of God and my righteousness and all of those things that you need, they'll be provided to you. They'll be added unto you. I would submit to you that our culture does not do that. Our culture is a self-centered, self-made man type style of culture. We're very independent. Now, that's a, there are good qualities of being independent, the free will choice we have before God, but the bad qualities are we often want to solve everything ourselves. That's how I was. We want to fix everything with our own leadership. We're, if we're type A personalities, we want to make sure we're in charge, we're in control, we've got it all sorted out. I have enough money to do this, we can do that. We can do what we, you know, we can satisfy our needs ourselves. God, could you help us with this? Could you help us with that? That's a very American ideal. That's kind of like in a, the new American dream in a lot of ways. But that's not God's kingdom. That's the kingdom of Babylon. If you understand it, that's really the mystery harlot trying to get us all drunk on the dependency of these things. So especially to the next generation my son and daughter are here and there are others who may be watching this other sons and daughters of families in the congregation forgive us your forefathers and parents a little bit like gideon's father if you remember the story from the bible who had an altar to Baal. forgive us for setting the wrong stage for what god was saying to do otherwise for pursuing what the 21st century in America would say for you to do. Grow up, get good grades, go to school, educate yourself, be something, go for it. Make something of yourselves. Achieve greatness, earn money, become wealthy, 
Be successful, leave a legacy, leave an inheritance for your kids. That's kind of the world's perspective of how you go through life. And maybe you'll do more good than you will have done bad. But that's not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is different. It's trusting and depending on him fully. It's coming together and depending on one another and loving one another instead of being isolated in our homes or in our financial walls or in our own perspectives where we may gather for church on Sunday, but what do we do Monday through Friday? How do we look at our lives? And that's my encouragement to you today and for this year ahead, to seek first the kingdom of God and righteousness and everything you thought you needed to worry about, you don't need to. God will make a way. That's our testimony, uh, Bridget and mine and our family, is trusting in him and he can make a way so that we can, instead of pursuing what the world around us, what the kingdom of Babylon says, this is what a successful life looks like, you can say, God, how did you make me? What have you made me to do? How have you made me to serve in your kingdom and build the kingdom, build the bride? What part of the bride do I belong to and how can I do that? And give me every ability to pursue a life in Christ and that'll be a life of fulfillment and that will be a life where when you're entering into the heavenly realm Jesus will say to you well done my good and faithful servants so I pray and I'm going to close in prayer now that everyone absorbs this message this is just the entry way into it but dig into it and if you anyone wants to discuss this please come up, approach me you could take a look at uh, our website. We have a ministry called The New Breed of Business, which is to take a new, fresh look at our business practices. Because many of our business practices do not adhere to the scripture. I don't know if you knew that. But we can exploit the poor. We can charge people interest when we're not supposed to. We can enter into a banking system that has no recourse or help or assistance for people and financial markets that facilitate similar things. So this is all part of this question, what is Babylon? And uh, just encourage you to press in. And as the Lord leads, uh, obey what he says by coming out of Babylon, whatever that means as God defines it for you. So join with me in prayer today, would you? Father, we just thank you for this timely message entering into 2022. The world has changed, but you are not surprised. You have a plan and it's laid out in your scriptures, Lord. And you said you would come back, Jesus, to judge the whole earth and to rule and reign where the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God. Show us what it means, Lord, this Babylon, this mystery Babylon, this great city that has deceived the whole world. Show us what that means, Lord. Show us how to come out of those practices. Show us where we're partnered in those practices and we should not have partnered. Uh, let us meditate on 2 Corinthians 6, which is another slide here that we didn't get to, and understand what this partnership point is about, yet reciting, come out, come out, depart from there once more. You're calling your people, Lord, out of worldliness and captivity, out of debt, slavery, income, slavery, career, slavery. Look at the disciples and how they were called out of a world's career. They were called out to do what? To seek first the kingdom of God, to serve Jesus in new ways of discovery. Lord, we pray that the people of God can similarly have a fresh coming out of whatever binds them, whatever enslaves them, held, held, holds us captive. Let us come out of that. Let us enter in with reckless abandon, Lord, casting our cares upon you, not looking back, not loving our lives unto the death, Lord. That's what you said. You said, come, follow me. And Lord, I pray that we understand that in a new and deeper way for the days ahead. To help others, Lord, when things are shaken, when storms come, we must be available and ready 
to help others instead of saying that the, the world around us is collapsing, help, help. We need to be in a position to help others, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.